Hey everyone, want to hear what it's like to meet a murderous drag queen, R2-D2, Freddy Krueger, and um, child Sonic the Hedgehog covered in blood? Then tune in to find out about my weekend at Horror Hound, Indianapolis. Don't forget to rate, subscribe, tell your friends about checking in with Mary Lynn, won't you? down the street is your head in a cloud don't you want to know what's going on let's go checking in with mary lynn checking in with mary lynn checking in with mary lynn let's check in with mary lynn hi everybody let's podcast I'm so excited. I have a lot going on personally, professionally, um, spiritually. Just kidding. Not really spiritually that much. Um, Don't forget to please subscribe, like, comment. Only good comments. If you have anything bad to say, just um, shove it down and swallow it and um, shit your pants about it. Okay, because I don't want to hear it. I need views, likes, uplifting things. Um, puppies, kittens, kittens, rainbows, unicorns. Not unicorns. I don't find that positive. That's a little too much fantasy. Puppies and kittens are real. Um, yeah, constructive criticism, sure. But I don't need anybody being mean. You know what? I'm not afraid of a negative review, but um, I really think you should leave a positive review. Tell five friends about the podcast because um, mommy's got to pay those bills, you know, and I'm not going to lie to you guys. I make about mm, give or take three million dollars a year from this podcast. So it's super important. Um, I, I do it. I'm kidding about that money. I do it uh, out of love, the love from my heart and um, the need to speak and connect. Is that so wrong? Is that so wrong? I did my first convention and it was super exciting. I had done Comic-Con years ago, probably at least 10 years ago, 15 years ago, I have no sense of time, uh, at the height of 24. Let's go ahead and say it was season five. I started 24, season three. I think I started in 2002 or three. Yeah, that sounds about right. And um, at the height of when I was on it, and I was on from season three to season eight when it ended. And then they, a couple years later, they brought it back again. But anyway, that was the bulk of it. And we went to a Comic-Con. We got whisked in. First of all, we were waiting on a loading dock outside with a bunch of trash and a real pungent smell. Reminds me of India. No disrespect. That's what it smelled like there in certain areas. Non people's houses. Don't be an asshole. I'm talking about when I went to the slums of India. That's what this loading dock smelled like. And we were all dressed up. And then we were whisked in the back door up at Comic-Con. I kid you not, there was a human chain on either side of us. Who was on the panel? I don't remember. All I can remember is Kiefer and I were there. And some of the other cast members. I only have eyes for Kiefer Sutherland. We went in through the human chain, we sat on this panel, which was above, um, did we sign pictures? We must have signed pictures. It wasn't a money-making ven- venture. It was uh, purely publicity. And lots of people lined up, and I think they had to cap off how many people they let down. And did we also do some sort of a discussion? I remember being in front of a panel, and uh, then we were whisked back out, And that was my experience. I didn't hang out there. So this is completely different because 
Um, I was booked through a, a friend, uh, through a guy who handled me and told me what the deal is and, and how, how to get there and when to show up. And it, it was a convention called Horror Hound in Indianapolis. And I was told many times that there's kind of a, a sister horror hound that also takes place in Cincinnati. If you're near one of these two places, you should check it out because it was a delightful event. I was also told several times by different people about the new venue. This was in a a convention center in Indianapolis and it was really large venue. This is a really popular event. And I got sort of, um, invited to go, even though I'm not, um, in horror films. I could be. Maybe I'll start now. If you know anyone who wants to cast me as um, an evil matriarch ghost from the 1700s who used to work in a whorehouse and now haunts slutty women in her ghost life. And I will never be settled until the women that I'm haunting stop using their bodies in ways that are less than pure. It's a Christian horror movie that I'm pitching, that I just pitched. Okay, so I get asked to do this. And sure enough, there were a few people. Oh gosh, no, I'm not going to think of who it is. Just go to the website There were a couple other people sprinkled in that weren't horror, but for the most part, I met some uh, people that are very popular in the horror community on the way there on the plane. I met Lynn Shea, and I met Lynn Shea was a very beautiful, was, is, I'm, I'm saying, I was using was as in when I met her as part of the story on the plane on the way there. I flew American Airlines. Um, There was no TV in first class. Um, It was kind of an older plane. You have to download the app and watch TV. On I'm not good at getting internet on planes, by the way. Okay, anyway, she was in a movie called Insidious, A Nightmare on Elm Street. Amityville, a new generation. She was also in Dumb and Dumber, Kingpin, and There's Something About Mary. There you go. Um, She was delightful and um, said that she felt weird leaving her house. And I said, me too. And we had a nice plane ride. I also met Bonnie Ahrens on the plane. Bonnie Ahrens, you know, for The Conjuring. The Fighter. Oh, she was in Mulholland Drive. Remember that? Sexy, sexy movie. And recently in The Nun. Did anybody see that? I'm not the biggest horror fan. Maybe I will be after this. Maybe I won't be. I'm not really going to tell you right now. I saw It while I was filming the movie Night School. Taron Killam, who was in the cast, he's one of those people that is is a real people person and likes to do fun things. And he took us all out to the midnight showing. I was like, I don't do things like this. And then uh, we did it and it was delightful and I was scared and I hated it. And so anyway, at the convention, you sit at a table and you have pictures and people come up and they buy packages if they want a picture or a selfie or both or however many pictures they want. And um, I have to say it was an odd experience, but for the most part, not for the most part. It was it was a delightful, it was great to meet all these people because th- they are paying to have an experience with you that they wouldn't have. And even though I do stand up and that's such a, a connecting thing for me and it's something where people come to see you and it's in a live show. And also my stand up is very personal and so, and, and I, I usually am accessible after the show's you can come up and have a similar moment to me as, um, but the convention is a whole different world. People, and I'm sure most people know this or most people have been to one. I don't have a lot of experience with this, but it's a certain 
mentality. It's, it's almost like if you go to a sporting event, there's a whole culture of people that go to these conventions and they save their money and they look forward to it and they pick out the people that they want to meet and they, it's a particular way to meet a fan who gets to have the experience that they want to have with you. And a lot of people talk to me about their experience with my work and all different types of things that I've been in. And it was pretty gratifying and it felt really nice. I mean, sometimes it felt a little bit repetitive. Um, It's the type of repetitive that you have to make new in every moment, almost like doing a press junket where you get asked the same questions, but you make it new because it is a new experience for that person, especially a lot of the um, questions about 24. But that's okay. That's part of it. And I'm happy to do it because it feels good. It makes the stuff that I've done live again in that moment, you know, and it was fun to see the different deeper cuts that people brought up, you know, people bring up Mr. Show or somebody brought up um, a poster from Punch Drunk Love and, and we're, we, I'm, I was out there, you know, I was out there on the floor meeting the people, making moments happen and it was a different kind of work than doing stand up and certainly than being on a set where you're pretty closed off and you don't have contact with people. Um, and you see a lot of adults dressed up. There's a lot of uh, Jasons and you tell me who the people are. I don't know and I don't care. There's a lot of the guy in the white mask Freddy Krueger, I think he had a bit of, uh, I think he was a bit autistic because he kept circling around and then talking to me, a guy completely head to toe as Freddy Krueger was talking to me like he was Jack Bauer. So he'd say, hurry up and get those files. But it was in character. He was sort of channeling Freddy Krueger as Jack Bauer. Uh, Why didn't I get that on film? So that was uh, maybe because it was terrifying. And I was frozen in fear. Uh, So that was pretty good. There's a lot of witches, a lot of ghouls. There was, um, what's the guy I was thinking of? Clowns from It. There was a very good Frankenstein. What was the thing I was just thinking that slipped my mind? Um... Something that a dude was doing. And there was a guy who had uh, a puppet of a crazy person that was clinging to his body and wrapped around him. That was pretty good. There was a little kid or like an adult on a tricycle as, um, what's his name? Bobby. I don't know any horror stuff. I'm sorry. I'm stupid. Uh, but that was terrifying. There was a, a family that dressed their kid up like Sonic the Hedgehog, but a bloody, murderous Sonic. That was my favorite slash least favorite. My favorite least favorite was little kids dressed up because that was really scary, but also kind of like fucked up. Like, why are you dressing your kids up like that? But that's part of this culture too, is a lot of these kids, um, my assistant Chelsea was telling me, how her friends have a kid who is uh, punk rock because they're punk rock. So it's like a little three-year-old. And that's how these kids are. They're being indoctrinated into this world of gore. And it's sort of fascinating. Maybe it just takes the normalcy or the, you know, abnormality out of it. And they're just like, oh, there's a bloody severed head. No big deal. You know, they'll be ready for the apocalypse, uh, the impending apocalypse. And maybe their parents are prepping them in the right way. They're just going to be like, no big deal. We're all dying. I'm just going to go on with my life. So that might be the some of the best parenting out there. Um, my favorite, I believe, I mean, there probably were a few more that I didn't see, but there were two. One on Saturday, one on Friday. I was there Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Um, my favorite was like the horror glamorous drag queen. So it's super duper platform heels fishnets, um, big hair, and then a 
just a horrible face, like really good body, um, womanly, you know, feminine body in a little shiny bodysuit, and then just a terrible grotesque face. My favorite, I had it on my Instagram. She's called um, Barbie Crashed It. Um, and the woman who was helping us at our table, Liz, was like, you know, it's a man, right? And I was like, okay, thank you for clarifying it. I think like a, maybe she's a little bit older than me, the generation that's like, but you know, that's a, a man dressed as a woman, right? You know, the gen- and the generation that's coming up below us is all like, sexuality is completely fluid, like probably wouldn't even acknowledge a man dressed as a woman. But I was like, yeah, I, I, I get it. I, I'm calling her she though. That's she, she's in drag. She's a horror drag, but her mouth was like a shark's mouth full of teeth that were dirty and bloody, but like four rows of teeth. So it was this awesome, uh, a makeup or was it maybe that was her real smile, but that was fantastic. And I didn't notice her, but she was there the whole time to the right of us down a few tables was, um, a tiny woman. And I guess she's on American horror story and she's a real life, uh, freak show type person so that was pretty cool um and also I was like great um my career is now I'm um part of the sideshow but that's good it's um humbling and um exalted at the same moment what what am I talking about I don't know I don't know new experience who dis so trying to figure it out who dat um there were also a lot of service dogs. And when I mentioned the autistic Freddy Krueger, he wasn't the only one. Most of them weren't in costume, but there were at least a half a dozen. Um, and I don't mean to lump them all in the same, but like, let's say two autistic people, one schizophrenic, one bipolar, and, you know, throw in a few extremely socially awkward people. And I think this is quite honestly a special venue and event where people can go and know that they're accepted and feel safe and sort of do things at their own pace and get to talk to people that they identify. I had a few people for Legally Blonde too that were just super pumped to see me there and, you know, asking me what it's like to work with Reese Witherspoon. Wouldn't you like to know, podcast audience? Um I'm not telling. No, it's not that I'm not telling. I just, I had a very brief experience with her and it was many years ago. So I was like trying to make this story come alive for them because, you know, they're watching this movie over and over again. And I, and I can barely remember a week ago, let alone 15 years ago. Um, But it's cool as well to be reminded of that and, and to realize that it has meaning with people. A lot of 24, a lot of, um, families that watch 24 together and um it's pretty amazing a lot of gail the snails and oh i was starting to say about the after the drag queens there was a lot of animals service animals really cute dogs um but my favorite was uh, the woman you know how people have a stroller that's for pets so it's screened in um she was my favorite because she came by and I saw something moving in there and and bouncing around and I went to go look at the little dog but I out of the corner of my eye I noticed it was moving really rapidly I kind of bent down to look through the screen and notice it was a uh rhesus monkey is that how you say it rhesus and I said hey like hi well, hi, little little monkey. And now I'm not saying the monkey needed to stop what it was doing and make eye contact with me. And I'm not saying I didn't get the attention that I deserve from this monkey. What I'm saying is this monkey did not acknowledge that another being was there or that it a, a sound had happened. And now I know monkeys aren't dogs. I, I guess what I'm saying is this is a completely wild animal that has no interest or ability capacity or desire to interact with humans and I talked to this lady 
I kind of had to stop everything. I said, stop the presses. What's going on? What's happening here? This, this is your pet? And she said, oh, I just, this isn't anything new for me. I've been doing this for 20 years. I've had monkeys. And she says they, her and her husband have four monkeys at home. And Chelsea caught that she, she also said that, uh, her husband was married before her. And I, I didn't hear her say this part, but that his first wife was really into monkeys too. So this was his second wife. One of the monkeys was her, her husband's and she couldn't physically, and she, she, um, confirmed what I was saying. I said, well, you can't really interact with them. Like they don't really care about you in terms of having a relationship or establishing rules. And she's like, no, but they let me handle them sometime and I can feed them and they're just my babies and they built rooms for them in their house and her her life is totally devoted. Uh, the little one we met was 18 months old. Her name, we didn't meet her, the one that was caged up and jumping around and, and then it, after it's... um. Um, incredibly fast bouncing it fell over in a nap in a stupor uh, sucking its thumb and this woman was like oh you ha- you're having a nap now and talking to it what, like it was an infant and this one's name was Aria and she said that its life expectancy is 30 to 40 years um, in my head I was going what the fuck are you talking about lady what are you doing but I I didn't want to, I wanted to respect her lifestyle choice. You know, I wanted to understand where she was coming from. And she loved these animals more than she loved people. And this was her way. And and then she bought uh, three combo packs and she autographed a picture for each monkey, except for her husband's monkey because she can't make contact. So, you know, I'm... I'm proud. I feel like somewhere over the great Midwest, somewhere in the uh, uh, proximity to Indianapolis, some state over there is a house full of rhesus monkeys who are taking turns with uh, ripping up an autographed picture of me that has been placed in their custom rooms in the house that their human parents made for them. Um, on either side of my table was um, Elizabeth Berkeley, and on the other side was Shannon and Elizabeth, and they were both a delight to pal up next to at the convention. And I, I think it's fair to say I pretty much had the time of my life, and I owe it to these fans to help me see myself in a new light, believe in myself, accept this uh, platform of inspiring people for roles that I play. There, I said it. You thought I was going to be snarky and and make fun. But let's just be honest. Um, I'd do it again in a gosh darn heartbeat because uh, that shit is hilarious. And I also owe Shannon and Elizabeth a uh, video for a charity that she runs called the Rhino Review which is saving rhinos. And um, I was a bit flabbergasted. Oh, not just flabbergasted, but it also was has, a couple of times it was beer o'clock in the middle of the day. I, I did have to drink a beer or two to buffer, to soften the experience around me because um, I listened to a guy who was schizophrenic talk at me for seven to 10 to 12 minutes about the um, imaginary people and the voices in his head and different traumas that he experienced as a child. Um, so, uh, I did go to the bar a couple times just to, uh, knock down, uh, the, um, clarity and the emotional clarity, um, of the situation and the listening that I was doing, um, had a beer and I didn't feel prepared to do my rhino review. And also, I don't really know anything about the rhino trade. So sometimes it's hard for me to get it up and be like, hey, there's this cause. 
that I have to research and figure out and find something intelligent to say. I mean, who wants rhino kill, r- rhinos to be killed? Nobody. But people are doing it. And she's fighting for it. So help her out, won't you? I think my video is going to end up being something like that. But, you know, look out for that soon. Um, look for me at your local uh, horror um, cosplay furry convention freak show convention of your choice because i'll do every one of those that i goddamn can and um if you ever hear of one uh check it out because they're pretty funny and great oh i also met r2d2 there were some ghostbusters there and um glad to be home thanks for listening we'll be back hit me up if you've been to any of these or if you if there's one that you love kind of curious all right thanks talk to you next time bye